Good evening to the few gathered here and to our online audience. My name is Dwight Doc Weiniger, and I'm very pleased to be your moderator tonight. This is a special privilege for me because I grew up in Peru, right down the road here in Nemaha County. And I graduated from Auburn High School in, well, we won't go into that. I graduated from Auburn High School. I'm currently working in my 42nd legislative session around the Capitol in one capacity or another. And I have a deep abiding love for this district, Southeast Nebraska, and for good public policy. I would like to thank Brent Comstock and the crew here at the Rural Impact Hub for making this evening possible. Tonight, we gather in recognition that our world has changed dramatically in the past two weeks. While acknowledging that change, it is important to note that we have an election here in Nebraska in just six weeks. Being respectful of the current pandemic and the governor's request to Nebraskans to practice social distancing, fewer than 10 of us are gathered here at the Rural Impact Hub in Auburn. And we welcome those of you who have joined us online for this important discussion. Our discussion tonight will be an opportunity for the voters of the first legislative district to get to know the three candidates better. These are three high quality individuals and the voters of the first district should be pleased these leaders have offered to serve their fellow residents in Lincoln. A number of legislative districts in the state have no choice of candidates this year, but those living in the first district have three strong candidates for the seat. The purpose of this forum is to have a thoughtful, professional discussion of the issues facing this state. We are not Washington, D.C., and the public is not served by the harsh discourse that currently often accompanies political discussions. Tonight, we want to get to know these candidates better and find out their thoughts on a variety of state issues. With that in mind, we will operate under the following ground rules tonight. Each candidate will have an opportunity to make an opening statement to introduce themselves to the voters of the district. Each candidate will get an opportunity to answer each question and we will alternate the order in which the candidates speak. And each candidate has an opportunity at the end of the forum to leave us with any closing thoughts they may have. I have a couple of final comments before we begin. The first is that the Rural Impact Hub invited people to submit questions for tonight's forum. We have utilized all of these questions to some extent and have combined a number that were submitted on the same subject and we've rewritten some to broaden tonight's policy discussion. With that in mind, we would like to thank the individuals that took the time to send us the questions involving state issues in Nebraska. And finally, if you're disconnected, we all understand the realities of rural broadband. If you're disconnected, please reconnect. And if you cannot get reconnected, the forum will be posted on the Rural Impact Hub website. Now that takes care of the preliminaries of the night. We have promised to not ask you your favorite place to get toilet paper right now. And so with that, we will go to the opening statements. Our first opening statement will be given by the incumbent senator from the first legislative district. Please welcome from Peru, Julie Slama. Thank you very much, Doc. I appreciate it. My name is Julie Slama and I currently serve as the state senator for District 1. I'm proud to be here in Auburn tonight because like Doc, I was born and raised in Nemaha County and it's my privilege to serve District 1. My service to District 1 has revolved around a simple concept. How do we grow Southeast Nebraska, not just now, but for generations to come? My top goals towards that end are achieving meaningful property tax relief for our property owners, achieving better funding for our rural, rural schools, investing in improving rural broadband access, which has become so much more important in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, ensuring that we have strong rebounds, not just from the 2019 floods that crippled our areas, but also now from shutdowns related to the COVID-19 crisis, and ensuring expanded access to rural health care, also important during our current pandemic. We'll talk more about these issues today, but I'm excited to have this discussion and would like to thank everybody here tonight for tuning in and for having this discussion. Thank you. 
Thank you, Julie. Now going second will be a local business owner and a member of the Pawnee County Board of Commissioners. Please welcome Dennis Sharp. Evening folks, uh, as Doc said, my name is Dennis Shart. I uh, just tell a little bit about myself. I am from uh, Table Rock, Nebraska. I uh, bought a meat processing plant about 34 years ago. I've been running it ever since. Uh, I've grown the business from like $100,000 to a couple million now. And I've raised my family in Table Rock in Pawnee County this whole time and they've all graduated from down there. Uh, as I've ran my business, I've uh, served on numerous different committees. I have uh, served on the village board at Tabor Rock. I'm currently serving as a county commissioner for seven years, been chairman for the last six, and I'm looking forward to hopefully getting your vote to serve the legislative district one this coming year. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And now to give her opening statement, another local business owner and a community leader from Odo County from the Nebraska City area. Please welcome Janet Palmtag. Hello, good evening. Hi, Doc. Thank Hello. you everyone for being here this evening. My name is Janet Palmtag, and I was born and raised in Nebraska City. I went to school at Lord Central High School, the Catholic school there. After high school, um, I attended the University of Nebraska. I worked my way through college and earned a degree in business. Uh, after college, I then moved to Nebraska City where I married my husband, John, and we raised three wonderful sons. I also have uh, two grandchildren. I'm a small business owner. We've got an office in Nebraska City, in Auburn, and in Rockport, Missouri. I'm running for the legislature because I care deeply about rural Nebraska. I know that I can make a difference and move things forward for rural Nebraska. I've worked hard for my family, my business, my community, and I promise to work hard for you as well. Thank you so much again for being here. Thank you, Janet. Now let's get started with the questions for this evening. First, uh, we will concentrate on taxes on the first part of the forum. And here's our first question. Given that property taxes are levied and spent entirely at the local level, what proposals at the state level are you looking at for either reducing or maintaining property taxes? Broad, more broadly, how does Nebraska achieve real property tax relief? So Dennis, you have the first question here. Property taxes, it's the biggest thing on everybody's plate right now. Um, my thoughts on it is that the schools are our main expense for taxes down in this area, and we all blame the schools, but I don't think that's totally right by blame them all. We have, I think, put too many regulations on them from the state, and I, if I get up there, I think we need to totally look at overhauling the Teosa. I know they've tried this year, they tried last year, I know it's hard, but we got to work with the large cities to make this a more fair game plan out there. Uh, taxes with schools, our schools are our most important thing though. If we don't have our schools in our communities, we don't have anything. So we got to work to lower the taxes of school, but we need help from the state to make it a more fair deal. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Now, Janet, it's your turn on this question. Well, I knew taxes would come up tonight. So taxes are too high for property. They have been for decades. Property tax should have been resolved years ago. Property tax should have been resolved last year. Property tax should have been resolved this session. Front end, very first issue, it should have been negotiated, resolved immediately because we are in desperate times. Our farmers cannot handle these high taxes. It's been a problem for years. Agriculture is our main economic driver in rural Nebraska. And I would go so far as to say our property taxes are abusive. Now I've been in real estate for a long time. It's been the most important thing for residential and commercial. In walking the district, I've spoken to several people 
that have said, hey, we've worked here, we've raised our family here, but we can't retire here because we are going to be on a fixed income and we can't pay for the taxes. We have people that we sell homes to that choose to live in Iowa or Missouri because the taxes are cheaper. So we are prohibiting people from coming to Nebraska because of taxes and we are pushing people out on, on, on their way to retirement. As far as commercial goes, it's an economic development situation. If our taxes are lower, we will get more companies to come to Nebraska. So we need to be very cognizant that it affects residential, commercial, and agriculture. Thanks so much, my time's up. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Julie, your opportunity to answer the property tax question. Thank you, Doc. And I think it's a great question and one that all three of us here today believe is the top issue facing District 1. And just to quantify this a little bit for you, Agland valuations have increased by 250% in the last 10 years. On average, 60 to 70% of your property tax bill goes towards funding education. We have a real dis disparity in education funding in our state because our urban school districts receive hundreds of millions of dollars in state funding each year. The majority of schools in District 1 and our rural schools do not receive a dime of state equalization aid. If we're going to make a real difference in our property tax environment in the state of Nebraska, we have to address that funding. That's why I'm a supporter of this year's property tax relief package, which ensures that every single school district in the state for the first time in Nebraska's history will receive some sort of dependable state funding so that our rural schools aren't entirely dependent upon our local property taxpayers to keep their lights on and their doors open. I also support the implementation of spending controls to ensure that that influx of money is spent responsibly. This is the top issue facing our district. We're in direct competition with three other neighboring states in Iowa, Missouri, and Kansas, and each have property taxes that are a fraction of Nebraska's. So this is a critical issue that we need real solutions to, and I'm up in Lincoln fighting for those solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Now our second question was alluded to a little bit uh, in the last uh, answer, and that is LB 974, which is a bill in front of the legislature that would lower property taxes by restricting the property taxes for schools and providing replacement revenue through the TIOSA state aid formula. Now the question that came to us is if all of the political subdivisions utilizing property taxes, for example, cities, counties, NRDs, ESUs, etc., if they all had been included in this bill, do you think the schools would have still fought so hard against the legislation? Uh, Janet, you get the first crack at this one. Well, thanks. I knew schools would come up too. <laughs> so um, to answer the question briefly, I believe that teachers, schools, everyone in our community wants lower property tax. I believe that the schools worry about depleting uh, the, the tax base and depending more heavily um, on state aid and getting fair payments for state aid. The people that I've talked to in the district are, are very worried about how the schools are going to end up in two or three years, given the, the current proposal. Um, our schools are critically important to our communities. They are the fabric of everything that we do in our communities. They are building our workforce right now. They are building our communities for the future. So we have got to take good care of our schools. Further, our schools are top in the nation, number six in some uh, cases, number eight in others, um, but we're commonly in the top 10. So people want to come to Nebraska, they want to work in Nebraska and live in Nebraska for our schools alone because, because they are so good. So it is a big economic driver to the state. And I hope that the current legislatures working on 
our bill right now to get that tax um, school funding through. I hope that they are talking to their teachers, their administrators, and I hope that they're talking to the school boards because those stakeholders need to be in the conversation. And I think that's part of the problem of why we don't have a solution yet. So thank you. I'm out of time again. Julie, your opportunity, would you please state being at ground floor there, whether you think 974 would have attracted more widespread opposition if all of the tax paying or tax utilizing entities would have been included? Thank you for that question. And I think it is a critically important one in understanding the inner workings of LB 974. And it really underscores the urban rural divide in the legislature. But before I get to that, since we did bring up schools, I just wanted to take a second to thank our teachers, our school administrators and school board members over the past few weeks, you've achieved a Herculean task of achieving distance learning for your students. That's something that takes most educational institutions years to do. And I have never been prouder of our schools in District 1 to see the hard work that you've put in to make this work. But LB 974 ensures that a student sitting in a classroom in Pawnee City has the exact same opportunities as a kid sitting in Papillion Public Schools when it comes to consistent state funding, permitting their school district to depend on something other than property taxes to keep their doors open. It's critically important in any property tax relief package that we introduce that consistent state funding to our rural schools. And the urban schools, as expected, came in opposition to LB 974. And I'm unsure as to what their inner um, ambitions were in trying to block that legislation, but I do know that the top three largest school districts in the state receive about half a billion dollars in TIOSA equalization aid every single year. And the majority of school districts in District 1 do not receive a dime in equalization aid. LB 974 changes that. That's why I so strongly support it. Thank you, Julie. Dennis, your chance to talk about 974 and, and wrap up on property taxes. So the question I think was more about what if the towns and the counties and all them, how their thoughts would have been if they would have came in on this or not. Um, being a county commissioner, uh, I've worked hard the last seven years to We've had to raise our taxes, but we were told to by our constituents because we needed things done. But you know what, when it comes time to tighten things down, we've worked on ways to make things work for us. So I think if the, all the groups would have came in, because I think it's only fair. I mean, I think we pick on the schools all the time because they are the biggest user of the money. But if you look at their budgets, what is it? It's, it's all employees, so they can't control that. And look at what insurance has done to them over the last 10 years. So to me, a shout out to the schools for trying hard and making things work. Is there some waste in schools? Yes, I believe there's some waste in schools. But I think with these, by moving 974 forward and maybe even a stronger one in a couple more years, because yes, it's giving money to all the schools, but it's still the urban schools are still doing very well. We need to tighten it down. We need to be more efficient about things and keep up the good work being teachers the right way. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. It's actually a good lead in to our next question. And that next question is, if property taxes are reduced significantly, do you have concerns about counties, schools, and municipalities uh, having adequate funding, especially the counties which saw decreased property tax collections due to the impact of the flooding? So Julie, would you take the first stab at that, please? Thank you, Doc. And to answer your question, I'm not that concerned that LB 974 would make significance uh, of an impact of the bottom line of District 1 taxing entities. We've actually found that our school districts in District 1 would be more or less, depending on the circumstance, be held whole. 
the challenge of the decreased property tax collections is one that I am very concerned about. Several of our school districts in District 1 and our taxing entities suffered big losses as a result of LB 512, which was a bill that we passed in 2019 that ensured that our landowners who had damaged or destroyed property could get reduced property taxes on that property, which was an absolutely necessary bill. The biggest issue was in heavily impacted counties like Nemaha County, we saw a decrease of uh, several hundred thousand dollars in tax collections when times were already tight. So this increased the burden in other areas of the district. For me, knowing that there is going to be a consistent state funding source there actually eases the burden on our property taxpayers and our school boards to give them some comfort that they'll have some flexibility in their budget without increasing pressure on our taxpayers. All right, Dennis, uh, if you would step to the podium, please, and ask the question about whether, answer the question of whether you're concerned about the other taxing entities. <clears throat> uh, yes, I'd be a little concerned, but I think it's all going to work out. I mean, everybody knows that in tight times, like we're going to have this year with this COVID going on, there's going to be a lot less money to be spent on things. They're just not going to be, people are probably not going to get all their taxes paid this year. So everybody's going to have to tighten up, buckle up. But we as Southeast Nebraskans, I think we work together. And we know when it's time to do things, we do it the right way and we make it happen. Thank you, Dennis. And now Janet, your shot at that property tax question. So we're back to property tax. <laughs> okay. Um, I am worried about losing funding for cities and counties. I was looking at my tax bill um, a couple of weeks ago. And to be honest, I was impressed with how our cities and counties are holding down the cost to run our cities and counties. They're doing a remarkable job and being very responsible with the money. So I would be concerned with anything that would take money away from our cities and counties. And there is kind of another inherent risk when we base our property taxes on market value. In 2008, when we had the real estate collapse, I was in a boardroom with a group of realtors and we were terrified on what was gonna to happen to our schools, our cities, our counties, when all of the property values in our country and our city um, would collapse. And we were terribly concerned about that until they had enough time to adjust the levy uh, the following year. Now, thank goodness, Nebraska was somewhat insulated from that complete meltdown in 2008. So I think we need to be very thoughtful in everything we do, especially when it affects our counties, our cities, and our schools in the property taxation. So thank you. Thank you, Janet. Now we will have our final tax question and it won't necessarily be property taxes, but there are no tax discussions in Nebraska that don't ultimately tax, uh, touch on property taxes. To lower the property tax burden, for example, would you support a tax on either groceries or on services similar to other states? And please explain. Uh, so food or services, would you support a tax on either one of those? Dennis, you're up first on this one. As you look at our neighboring states, they all have a tax on food, I believe. And I think I, I, as a, I sell food and I would support tax on a food. I think it should be, you know, I think if we'd open up the whole tax system for sales tax and even service taxes, we'd open up instead of maybe having to be five and a half percent, maybe it only have to be 2% for everybody, but it'd bring in so much more money if you've made it a broad thing. And we, maybe it's time to look at some of the exemptions that we have for people that don't have taxes. I mean, I said in a hearing one time up in Lincoln and the Omaha Zoo come in there and they're not taxed on their thing. That I think it was Senator Groney or Friesen or one of them said, man, if we tax you, we could make a million and a half of dollars off of you. You know, so, you know, we got to look at things like that. I mean, we all try to give and take, but, you know, I think it should be fair all the way across the board. 
I definitely would support putting tax on our food to lower our tax land taxes down. And I would have to seriously look at the service side of it, I guess. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dennis. Janet, your chance at this question. Okay, last tax question, right? <laughs> <laughs> so tax on food and services. Those are two things that I worry greatly about taxes on. I worry about taxes on services because I think that that will shift a big burden to a, a great deal of people. And I think it will affect them in a very negative way, obviously. Food, I am against taxes on food as well. I think that taxing food will disproportionately affect the people in need in our district and our state. We have a lot of people living in poverty and food and shelter are some of the most important things they have and I don't think we should be upping the cost on food and shelter for people. Um, I think that there are some options out there. Um, I would love to discuss other options for taxation. I do know that the internet taxation took way too long to get passed and now that we do have internet taxation, I think that that's going to fill a big gap and I think it's responsible for a lot of our additional tax revenue right now. So I was really grateful for that tax. Um, but I cannot say that I would support food and I will not support service taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Julie, your chance at this question. Thank you. And with this question, it's important to frame it as, as a fiscal conservative, I would rather see us cut the wasteful spending from our budget first before the government look for other ways that they can raise additional funds. So for me, first and foremost, before any additional taxes on services or getting rid of exemptions are discussed, we need to talk about cleaning up our own house and cutting out the wasteful spending. In addition, Nebraska has been blessed to have some really good years compared to where we've been in the last decade. So based on a 20 year average, we're currently sitting at about a $350 million budget surplus. Those are funds that can be used towards easing the tax burden on Nebraska's Nebraskans, whether it be through property tax relief, lowering income tax rates, or changing, lowering the sales tax rate. It's critical that before the government go looking towards raising taxes, that first we address wasteful spending and look at money that's already available to us. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. We'll move off of taxes now uh, to another subject, subject of schools. Now various proposals have been discussed that would utilize public support for private or charter schools. For example, LB 1202 was introduced this year to provide donors to private schools a tax credit. Given that background, would you support legislation to A, create charter schools in Nebraska, B, create a voucher program for private schools, or C, provide tax credits for supporters of private schools. So uh, the question is charter schools, uh, vouchers for private schools, and tax credits for private schools. Um, Janet, I believe you're up, well, wait a minute. Uh, yep, yep, Janet, Janet, you're up first. I had to, had to check my cheat sheet, but Janet, you're up first this time. Yep. Okay, so again, um, schools in Nebraska. We do have school choice right now. Um, we can choose to go to a private school or we can choose to go to a public school. So we're grateful for those opportunities. Um, I would support tax credits for schools if we can figure out our school funding that we have right now. We've all been talking most of this um, forum about property tax and the problem with funding schools. So until we get 
our school funding figured out, we can't consider anything else. We've got to resolve that issue that's gone on for very long. Um, I went to a private school. I went to Lourdes Catholic School, got an incredible education. And back then in those days, my parents were crabbing about how unfair it was that we didn't get a, a tax credit. And so I grew up hearing about those problems. And so it's, they've perpetuated for a very long time. But so have our problems with funding public schools. So we have to resolve those issues. Thank you. Out of time again. All right, Julie, your shot. Uh, charter schools, uh, vouchers, or tax credits for private schools, or all of the above, or none of the above? So on those three subjects, charter schools, vouchers, and tax credits, I have to say very simply, we have to get our school funding figured out and uh, make our school funding uh, programs more equitable across the state before we consider those issues. We have 11 public school districts in District 1 and two private schools, and all 13 of those schools are outstanding for our kids in District 1. You cannot go wrong in choosing a school in District 1, which I think is outstanding. At the end of the day, there are some great ideas out there about how we can improve funding for our education to some of our uh, private schools but we have to fix this urban rural divide in school funding and address the 30 variable behemoth that is the Teosa formula, which we haven't discussed this yet. We've already gone through a few questions that referenced it. Teosa is the formula that establishes which schools receive equalization aid from the state and which do not and how much. And that is a 30 variable equation that requires almost a doctorate in economics to understand. So for our school bu uh, board members, for our people who are setting the budgets, this is something that has to be simplified, streamlined, and made more fair across the board before we get into other subjects when it comes to education funding. All right, Dennis, charter schools, vouchers, or tax credits for private schools is the question. That's a good question. Um, I have a lot of customers and friends that send their kids to two private schools in our district and they probably not gonna care for some of the things I wanna say about it, but I'm gonna say them anyway. Um, as the other two, I, I think until we get our tax situation figured out for our public schools, we cannot be giving out, handing out vouchers or any type of money tax credits like that to, for anybody. Um, all our schools are very good in these in this district and we need to keep, make them better, but we gotta get them somehow to be more efficient, how they run. And maybe we need to look at the state and say, you know, it seems like back when they had no kid left behind is when all these problems started, when things really started to raise up. And I understand that. And what I'm worried is with that rule, the private schools probably won't get some of them title kids and most of them will have to stay in a public school and that's where a lot of the expense comes. So until we get that figured out, I'd probably be against vouchers and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. All right, let's move on. The coronavirus has swept our nation and state and caused a dramatic shift in the ways we work, educate our children and live. The lack of reliable broadband service in rural Nebraska has proved to be a significant challenge during this pandemic. The issue is both an educational and an economic development issue in rural Nebraska. Discuss what Nebraska can do to increase rural broadband access. And Julie, you get the first shot at that answer. Rural broadband access is something that is very personal to me. 
I live about a mile and a half outside of Peru, up in the hills along the Missouri River. And those of you who have been out to that area know that line of sight internet access is never going to work out for us. In fact, up to my junior year of high school, we were fully dependent on dial-up internet. And I know of several families in District 1 who are still dependent on dial-up internet. In this day and age, that's unacceptable. I'm proud to support increasing rural broadband access, and I'm proud to be a supporter of Senator Brand's LB 996, which is currently on final reading, so the final stage of debate for the 2020 session. This bill would put us in the front seat for millions of dollars in federal funding to expand broadband access, not just with those typical line of sight towers that certain companies are using to get funding that don't actually uh, ensure access to all Nebraskans, but fiber optic internet, which is faster, far more reliable, and several communities in District 1, like Fall City, have already been blessed to have. So for me, we have to support policies which expand rural broadband access because Southeast Nebraska and rural Nebraska simply won't grow without the internet. Dennis, would you like to offer your thoughts on rural broadband? This is probably my second most important issue that I'm running for. Uh, broadband is a big problem in our area. Down in Pawnee County, we have a lot of hills, just like Julie does over by the Bluffs, and we don't have much service for broadband. And now with this COVID-19 going on and schools trying to teach from school, we got too many kids out in the country that can't make the internet connection work. So to me, it's a very high priority to get something figured out for it. Uh, the bill they have in the legislature, I think it's a good start and will hopefully get us a lot of money into Nebraska to help develop our program, make it work. But not only is it good for schools, it's good for businesses. And it's also, you know, back when I grew up, if you drove 30 miles to go see something, it seemed like a long way. But for people now to drive 60 to 70 miles to work and live out in our area and drive to Lincoln or Omaha is nothing. And with them people being home, they cannot work from home because they do not have the capability of getting hooked onto the internet very well. So it's a very touching thing to my heart that we get something fixed up, move it back so we can all live where we want to live and enjoy life as we see it. And Southeast Nebraska is where we want to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Now, Janet, your thoughts on rural broadband access. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm excited that we may have opportunity to get some grants from the FCC uh, for broadband uh, in Nebraska. The root of the problem with broadband, though, right now are broadband maps. Currently, the maps show good service in cell or broadband bad throughout our district. So we've got these maps that have data on them. And the data is provided by the carriers that give us the service in the area. So the maps are wrong. The maps are not accurate. They are based on things that, that aren't correct, unfortunately. The FCC needs information on our broadband from the people on the ground, us. In order to get accurate, broadband numbers, what we have up and down speed and what our cell service is. The FCC has an app for a phone. Right now, you can actually go to the Nebraska Farm Bureau website and get directions on downloading the FCC app on your phone. Then go out to your field or go outside of your home, press the button, it will check to see what your cell is, what your broadband is, and it will send the data and your exact location directly back to the FCC so that we can get correct maps. If we have correct maps, we will know how bad the problem is uh, in our rural communities. And then we can qualify for all of these grants based on our, our service levels. So that's where we have to start at the root of the problem for, for broadband. I have a lot more to say on that, but my time is up. <laughs> Thanks. All 
Our next question we would like to talk about is the coronavirus and the reaction to it from a public policy standpoint here in Nebraska. The governor has issued a number of statements, but Nebraska has not yet issued a stay at home or a shelter in place uh, order as many of the other states have. Uh, so a two part question. First, uh, how do you view the guidance from the governor on the gathering restriction uh, due to the coronavirus, uh, and should that be made more formal is the first question. Do we need a formal uh, stay-at-home order in Nebraska? And second, are there additional uh, recommendations you would make regarding public policy as it relates to the coronavirus? So, Dennis, if you'd take the first shot on this issue. Wow, if we would have had this forum three weeks ago, we wouldn't have to even talk about this, would we? Wouldn't that have been nice? Uh, you know, as being a county commissioner, and I'm co connected very close with this COVID thing that's going on. Uh, we started on this thing probably three weeks ago up in Lincoln, Nebraska. We was at a meeting, and we had the health department come in from up there. And then we also, Grant Bergerman from our rural health department down here was there and talked to us about it, and it opened everybody's eyes up. And there's a lot of naysayers at the time, and there's still some naysayers today, but I think as it's progressed along and we see what's happened on the coast and everywhere else, we're um, starting to come around, I believe. And I think the governor's made some good steps in doing things. Um, I guess the only thing with the governor, what I see is kind of funny is it's amazing how we have all these rules, but in a time of need, how we can relax them so easily. So if it isn't a big deal, otherwise, why do why why can't they be relaxed all the time? But I think the leadership's there. Uh, the stay at home thing it's coming, guys. It's going to happen. I would say down here in Southeast Nebraska, we've been very lucky. You know, for the ones that haven't really traveled away, we haven't felt the impact. But it's coming. I would say in the next week to two weeks, it's going to be here pretty hard, and we're all probably be staying at home, unfortunately, and trying to beat this. And I hope that everybody pays attention so we don't get sick and we don't lose any one of you because every one of you is important to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Janet, you're up next uh, on the concept of a stay at home order and what other policy recommendations you might have at this time of the pandemic. So Janet. Thank you. So I am very proud of what our Senate and Congress has done to get us emergency funding for our country. I'm also very grateful for our state legislature and the governor for getting us a package for Nebraska very quickly. So I think that they're doing a very good job. I am grateful to the governor that he is giving us daily updates on the situation. Um, not only from the state level, but the local level. In our businesses in Nebraska City, we've had several situations where we have had to call uh, Greg Goebel, our, our local emergency management person, and the Southeast um, Nebraska Health. Stephanie was so helpful with the situation. Um, if this happens, what do we do? They were calm, helpful, and they answered the phone when we called. We didn't get voicemail or, or any sort of a system to push buttons. So, so I'm very grateful for our local, um, our local people as well. Our mayor's doing a great job, all of our mayors. Um, I think that we are gonna come out of this thing stronger than ever. I think our families will be stronger. I think our communities will be stronger. And I think everyone's gonna be a lot kinder when this is over. So I hope we learn a lot from this horrible situation that we're in. Time's up, thanks. Thank you, Janet. And if we could all be kinder to our lobbyists, that would be a good thing. <laughs> Julie, your, your thoughts on uh, the stay at home concept and any other pol policy issues uh, involving coronavirus. Well, thanks for giving some levity there, Doc. I appreciate it. I just want to frame this question by saying everybody watching at home should know without a doubt COVID-19 is not a conspiracy. It is not a hoax. It is something that you need to be taking seriously. 
And no, we don't have legal restrictions in place yet as to how many people can gather their CDC recommendations right now, but that could escalate to a government ordered stay at home order if people continue to skirt those guidelines and continue to have large gatherings. If those continue, we will have an outbreak in Southeast Nebraska. So please, for the sake of our small businesses, those at-risk populations, our healthcare workers, please follow those guidelines before it has to become a legally enforceable order. We were able to go back to work last week in the legislature and quickly pass an $83.6 million emergency appropriation to the governor's emergency fund from our rainy day fund to ensure that our state had the resources it needs to keep our local health departments funded, purchase enough personal protective equipment, so gowns, face masks, and other protective equipment for our state during this crisis, and also ensure that our healthcare facilities remain fully staffed. We were able to contrast ourselves with DC, DC politics by passing it with minimal um, speeches, respect for each other's space and time. There was no grandstanding, there was no partisan politics, just good policy. And I was honored to be a part of that emergency appropriation. Thank you, Julie. Next one is a little more open-ended question, and if so, we'll give them two minutes to respond on this. We're combining a couple of questions here and a little more open-ended. The question is, how do the communities of Southeast Nebraska continue to grow and prosper? Specifically, what actions can the state legislature take to help our communities to meet the housing, childcare, economic, and social needs of our towns? So what is it going to take for the communities to prosper and how can the legislature help in areas of housing, childcare, uh, and other economic social issues. So Janet, you get the first shot at that one. Thank you. I think our state is trying to help our rural communities in a lot of different ways. Um, Workforce housing is, is very important for us to recruit uh, businesses. We have to have employees and we have to have, we have to have houses for those employees in order to recruit companies, keep the companies that we have and grow them. The daycare issue is becoming a huge issue for communities. Um, in order to have a strong workforce, we've got to have good daycare uh, in our rural communities and we have been absent of that. However, I, walking the district, I have heard many people talk about how they are establishing daycares in their community to fill the gap of all the children um, that, that need care. We also need quality, quality early childhood education. The investments we make on that end pay off hugely on the back end. So I'd like to see a little more help from the legislature on early childhood education. There's a million things that we can do uh, from the state to help. We in the district have had certain areas that have trouble getting power sources, um, enough power to an economic development site to recruit companies, and it's a chicken and egg thing but we need to talk to the state about how we can install infrastructure in advance so that it is ready for a company when that company is ready to come to Nebraska. Because as we know in economic development, timing is everything. When that company is ready to pull the trigger, we have got to have a site ready. We might not be able to have a building that suits them, but we sure need to have the power and infrastructure there to handle that. So I'd like to see some economic development uh, packages uh, with respect to that. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Julie, your chance to talk about how the communities grow and prosper and what the legislature can do in the areas of housing, child care, and economic issues on behalf of those communities. Fantastic. Well, not to beat a subject that we've already covered, but when it comes to housing, the best thing that we can do to grow our housing stock and get 
homeowners, not just renters, but homeowners in our communities is by offering property tax relief. Outside of that, I just wanted to note what uh, Janet said earlier in terms of economic development and electric utilities, because that's actually a conversation that I've been a part of. Uh, there is a separation of powers in terms of what the legislature can do and what our public power districts can do. From my office's perspective, I've taken on the role of facilitating that discussion between our public power districts and our economic developers to ensure that the lines of communication remain open and that our economic developers can get what they need to grow their communities. That leads into a larger discussion about infrastructure in our district. Infrastructure just isn't broadband access. It's also the quality of our roads. I've been working with the Department of Transportation to resurface a lot of our highways that are in desperate need of repair. Highway 50 south of Syracuse needs help. Highway 67 in spots, the Brock Highway. These are all problem areas that as I've gone to every single corner of the district, I have kept track of the quality of these roads and reported back to the Department of Transportation to say, hey, when are these roads that are in desperate need of repair going to get those repairs? And the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So I'm up there advocating for the district in all areas, whether it be infrastructure, housing development, working with the Southeast Nebraska Development District, which has been a huge help, not just in obtaining federal grants and resources to grow our housing stock in Southeast Nebraska, but also helping our impacted communities grow um, and recover from the 2019 floods. Thank you, Julie. Dennis, your thoughts about helping Southeast Nebraska prosper, what the legislature can do on housing, child care, and economic issues. This is something I've been 30 years ago working on when I sat on the city councils. Uh, we had a lot of in Tabrock and Pawnee City and Pawnee County areas, which where I'm from, but we did a lot of rehab to houses and stuff. But I guess what I see is what we're really needing now is we needing that three bedroom house for that medium age younger couple to move into that can join our workforce. I don't know how many times I've almost tried to hire somebody to move in from Lincoln or Omaha and they come down and they look at the houses and they go, ah, I don't want to move here because, you know, I know that old house that grandma moved out of can be fixed up a little bit and whatever, but that's not what I'm really looking at. And that's our generation right now. They want something nicer and they want a little bit bigger than what it was before. So part of that problem, I don't know, it's, that's done by the federal level because they're the ones that dictate the rules of how that money comes in a lot of times. So we need to, Maybe have our legislators and governor push on the federal people to say, we need to change these rules. I mean, if we can spend forty to $50,000 on a house, fix it up, and 20 years from now, it's basically the same way, wouldn't it be smarter maybe to take forty or $50,000 and put it to a newer house, uh, 1,800 square foot house, build a three, dollars $400,000 $400, house, and put a down payment so then people could get in there and then we would have people coming back here to live because everybody wants something better. You want it better. I want it better. Everybody wants to come here and have something better. Uh, the road structure, we got to have that coming down here. I've been up there and talked to them, same as Julie. Uh, we have a lot of issues with the highways. I think Highway 50 and 75 are, are lifelines going north and south in this area. And we need to improve them ro roads to bring businesses that can get to and from here and for our people to drive back and forth to work. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. We'll move on to the Second Amendment. While the Second Amendment is in the federal constitution, there are annually related issues that come before the legislature. As an example, earlier this year, there were numerous stories about people carrying loaded weapons into legislative hearings at the Capitol. So feel free to make a general statement on the Second Amendment, but we'd like you to specifically answer this question. Do you believe people should have the right to open carry in the Capitol building? And if you do believe they should, are there any restrictions you would support? If not, 
how would you change the current rules? So the Second Amendment and the issue of open carry in the Capitol. And Julie, you're up first on this one. So I'll start this question off by saying I am a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I am a concealed carry permit holder myself and in places where it is legal to do so, you can bet I'm carrying. We had an incident this year where there were a couple of people who decided to open carry rifles within the Capitol. Under our current rules, it's legal to do that. You cannot concealed carry within the Capitol building because it's technically also a courthouse. The state Supreme Court is housed there. So there are some technical issues associated with that question that, are, that should be left to the lawyers. Um, but when it comes to the Second Amendment, I'm on the front lines defending that right by serving on the Judiciary Committee. We've had a couple of attacks that I think were entirely unfounded on the Second Amendment in this biennium that I was honored to help put a stop to. One was LB 58, which would have confiscated firearms of households without any type of due process and without any type of accusation of a crime. This was a bill that I ardently opposed during the committee hearing and work to block even after it advanced to the floor to ensure that even though it had advanced from the committee against my opposition, that it remained unprioritized and would not advance during this session. So again, I'm a strong supporter of the Second Amendment and look forward to continuing to do so while serving District 1. Thank you, Julie. Dennis, do you have thoughts on the Second Amendment and also the issue of open carry in the Capitol? Thank you. Uh, for up front, I am very much a second minute person. I have been a hunter all my life. I carry a gun. I had a concealed carry permit. I gave it up a couple years back because uh, when you have young kids that drive your vehicles and you have a concealed carry in there and you get stopped, someone's going to be in trouble. And it's probably not just them when that happens. So I gave my concealed carry up. I'll probably be re-getting one now that my kids are all getting to the 21 and above thing. Uh, for the thing that happened in the Capitol, that's a little frightening to me. I don't know if, I think somebody carrying a rifle into the state Capitol, I, I have a hard time doing that. I'd just be like if somebody carried one into the bank down on the corner, what do you think is gonna happen guys? I mean, that's just not normal. I mean, you got a gun, there's a reason for that gun, then you put the gun in the right place. Uh, but once again, I am, and I would definitely, uh, LB 58 that came through, I'm proud of Julie for standing up and fighting that up off. I know she tried not to let it get out of committee, but it got out. Uh, we got some pretty radical people around here that believe in that stuff. And I do not believe in that. Um, I don't think they should be able to just come take our guns away from us. So once again, I believe in carrying my own guns and looking forward to supporting you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Janet, your thoughts on the issue? Thank you. Well, we are all three Second Amendment people. I'm definitely for protecting our Second Amendment. No question about that. What happened at the Capitol this year was disturbing and quite scary. It was a threatening situation. I remember years ago, um, maybe 10 years ago, I went to visit the governor in the Capitol, and I remember walking up to his office, um, walking past a few people, and I walked right in and had a nice visit with the governor. But when I left that appointment with the governor, I did think to myself, what happens if some mentally unstable person comes in here and shoots my governor? I had complete open access to the governor. And that's one of the beautiful things about our capital. We have access to our lawmakers. We have access to our governor. But the situation that happened at the capital and my experience a few years back where I was actually worried when I left because we had such op open access, it's causing me to rethink. And I think that they do need to consider it uh, to be a safety issue of our, our lawmakers Right now, we can't be having anything happen to our governor. And I know that he has, um, uh, 
security around him at all the time. But that's a couple of guys from the state patrol. I know they do great work. I still, I still worry about that. So I'm second amendment, but we have to figure out a way to keep guns out of the mentally unstable people. And that's going to take a lot of work. So thank you. Thank you, Janet. Our next issue is the pro-life issue or pro-choice issue, depending on your perspective. The Supreme Court of the United States is returning more and more issues to the states to determine policy for their respective states. One of the issues that the Supreme Court has deferred to the states has been the issue of abortion. Is there any specific legislation that you would either introduce or support as a member of the legislature involving the issue of abortion. And Dennis, you're up first on this one. Um, I belong to St. Peter's Lutheran Church down in Elk Creek and I do not believe in abortion. <laughs> Simple as that. Um, it's pretty close to my heart when you talk about it and I could not ever see doing anything other than that. So. I know I got a whole 90 seconds to talk, but I up front with you, I do not believe, I mean, abortion, I'm totally against it. And that's where I'll leave it at. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dennis. Janet, your thoughts on the issue. Pro-life is an ongoing uh, concern for our entire uh, country, uh, abortion. I am pro-life, but I do think that we can do some things to help women in the state of Nebraska with prevention, and we can help them with education. I would like to see no woman have to make that decision that is legal right now. So I'm not sure exactly what legislation, but I would like to see health care a lot more available for women, for prevention and for education, especially um, in violent rape situations. The women's health issue is a big, big concern in rural Nebraska and across the nation. About half of our rural hospitals do not handle maternity services any longer because it is so expensive and we must keep our rural hospitals open. So that is a big concern to me, uh, maternity care. Further, when we are in rural communities and we don't have maternity care, we better have access to air ambulances and ambulances that are in network. We should not be surprised with a huge bill when um, someone has to get to a hospital that doesn't offer the services in the local communities. Thank you. All right, thank you, Janet. Julie, your thoughts on the issue? I consider myself to be pro-innocent life. I'm all for protecting unborn children within their mother's womb, but at the end of the day, I do support the death penalty. For me, being pro-life is about protecting those that can't defend themselves. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of two major pieces of pro-life legislation. I was a co-sponsor of LB 209, which ensured that women seeking abortions knew that if they decided to have a chemical abortion and they took the first pill and changed their mind, that they knew and were informed at the time of their appointment that they should seek medical attention because there was a chance that if they did not take that second pill, that they could save that pregnancy. LB 209 passed, it had a 10 and a half hour filibuster, and I teamed up with the bill's introducer, Senator Albright, who is an outstanding pro-life senator, to get that bill across the finish line. So we are saving lives in Nebraska because of LB 209. The next bill, which I'm proud to co-sponsor, so I've got a track record here, is Senator Geis LB814, which would ban dismemberment abortions in Nebraska. So right now in the state of Nebraska, it is legal for an abortionist to dismember a baby 
limb from limb while it is still alive in its mother's womb as a means of ending the pregnancy. LB814 would end this barbaric practice once and for all. And I'm excited to get that bill across the finish line and continue supporting pro-life legisla legislation and protecting the unborn. Thank you, Julie. Next two questions will have to do with the corrections issue. Um, the first one is a relatively uh, specific question. The second one will be a little bit more general as we get to it. But specifically, do you support the recent raise given to the Director of Corrections by Governor Ricketts? If so, please explain why. And if not, how would you propose to lower the salary paid to the director, seeing as how that is a, uh, an executive branch decision and you're coming in as a legislator. So that would be the first question would be the governor's recent decision on the director of correction salary. Uh, Janet, you are up first. Thank you. I was surprised to read about the raise for the director of corrections. I'm not sure what his job encompasses, but I know it has got to be hard and it must be very stressful. But 30% to me was surprising. I think that if the state has extra funds available for corrections, it needs to go to the people on the front line that are in danger every day because of the overcrowding and because of the shortage of staff. So it's a critical situation. And if not that, we need money for programming, for the education, for prisoners before they are let out of prison so that they can function in society, pre-sentencing um, situations. So there's a lot of things that the money could and should be used on. I certainly question the 30%. Julie, you're up next on this issue on the Director of Corrections salary and what, if anything, the legislature should do about it. So this question gets at a larger issue our state is facing that I'm guessing we'll be getting in the next question. Um, but unlike my predecessor, I do know the ins and outs of Director Frakes' job. I've had the chance to meet with him dozens of times, whether it's touring the Tecumseh State Correctional Institution, the state pen, or even just working with him on legislation to do what Janet was just addressing in terms of expanding programming, improving our facilities, and ensuring that our frontline workers, those who are staffing our prisons and ensuring the safeties of our communities can be compensated fairly for their work. You know, at the end of the day, the legislature doesn't have a say in uh, executive decision salaries. So that's something I'm not gonna comment on, but I wholeheartedly support fairly compensating all of our correction staffers from the director on down to the janitorial staff fairly for their work. I think the new contract negotiated between FOP and the executive branch is an outstanding step in the right direction. And that's going to help ease the understaffing issue we're facing, especially at the Tecumseh State Correctional Institution. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Dennis, your thoughts on this issue? With the correction thing being right in my backyard there, just 17 miles away, uh, a lot of employees come from my area and from all over district going to work there. Uh, when I heard the 30% thing, I thought, wow, that's a pretty good shot, you know, an arm for him. You know, I don't know what he was making before that, but, you know, hearing that, I, I think it's tough for anybody to give anybody in any type of thing a 30% raise. Uh, you see this in all these big businesses across the U.S. where they people get a million dollar bonus or raise or something like that. And I just wonder myself, how is somebody really worth that much more? Uh, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. I don't know. It was the governor's decision. He made that decision, but I probably don't really agree with it, but that's his decision. As for that money though, I really thought that maybe 
I mean, I know they're giving the employees more money up there. They're making more money. And with them, by hooking up with Peru to try to train more people to come there, I think that's a good thing. Uh, I just think um, the guy that's kind of running that prison in Tecumseh now that they brought in used to run a private prison. I think he'll do a good job there. Um, I hope that the politics don't get in the way of him running it. Um, I think coming from a private prison, he knows how to make it work somehow and he'll get the job done there. So I really think we need to keep promoting the people that are there and protecting them with everything we can and giving them raises because I know I sure don't wanna work there, but I commend the people that do work there. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. The second question starts out with a specific statement, but it's really more of a general question. The statement that was submitted for our consideration was a critical staffing emergency had been declared for several of our state's prison, obviously including the Tecumseh State Correctional Institution. In recent months, the governor and the union representatives, as uh, Julie mentioned, uh, for FOP 88 decided uh, to give a significant raise, negotiated a raise to corrections corporals, caseworkers, and sergeants who were all covered under that union contract. Now, one of the interesting side results from this is that supervisors of those employees, such as lieutenants, case managers, and unit managers, in many instances are making less than those whom they supervise. Uh, so the question is, one, is that a sustainable model in your mind? And two, uh, just your general comments where you wanna go with this as far as staffing at Tecumseh uh, in particular uh, and the other correctional industries, uh, other correctional uh, institutions as well. So Julie, you got started down this road. We'll let you go the rest of the way. Julie, you're up first on this one. This is an issue that has been brought to my attention as the FOP contract has been finalized. At the end of the day, the uh, correctional staff on one side of the aisle is represented by a different union than the supervisors and other prison staff. So it comes down to that union negotiating out a fair contract between the executive uh, branch in terms of what is a fair compensation for their work, especially given the fact that we've been able to give our FOP represented members such a good raise. So I would encourage those union negotiations to go on. I know they've been happening on and off over the last several years, and I would encourage them to keep going so that we can ensure that all of our prisons, especially Tecumseh, can remain staffed. One of the biggest hurdles that Tecumseh faces in being staffed is our habitual underinvestment in our prison system. Tecumseh was the last maximum security facility we built in our state, and that was over 20 years ago. Other facilities are very, very old. The state penitentiary was built at the turn of the last century and is hopelessly outdated. I support the concept of expanding our facilities because when you look at the crowding in our prisons, we do have a high prison population, but we don't have a high per capita population that's in prison. That's because we've failed to invest in the sales, the cells and the space we need to properly contain our prisoners and keep our staff safe. Thank you, Julie. Dennis, I appreciate hearing from you on this issue. As Julie, I agree. I mean, I think there's, uh, I didn't realize the supervisors are making less than the other ones. I mean, if I was a supervisor, I'd probably quit and go back and be the other position, you know. Uh, that's just how life is. I mean, somebody that's overseeing somebody should be making more than that person underneath them, I feel. I mean, that's, they've been there the time, they put their time in, and they're, they're the ones when things go wrong, they're the ones that's going to get blamed too. So they need to be compensated for that amount. Um, I think I mean, it's been, I remember when they first built that prison and the whole Southeast district got together to try to get it moved down here and built down here and stuff. I was kind of just in the ending stages of that when I got out of school and helped do that. But uh, I think we need to expand our prison, uh, our one in Lincoln. I mean, it's so outdated. Uh, it needs to be knocked down or something. We need to build, we need to look at building another prison. 
I mean, it's simple as that. Um, I mean, we've tried everything to keep people out of prison by doing drug courts and so they don't all end up there. But in reality in life, if you've done the crime, you got to pay the time. So you need to be there. So I think we need to maybe add on more prison cells somewhere. Being, could be in Tecumseh or be in Lincoln or somewhere else in the state. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Janet, your thoughts on the prison issue. Well, our prison system is in a critical position right now. We have over 2,000 more prisoners than our facilities can handle, I'm told. And we're adding a couple hundred more prisoners a year to the problem. So the problem is, is gigantic. As far as the pay and the decisions made from the human resource departments and their union negotiations, those are HR issues. And I put that back to the director of corrections to get those things figured out and make them fair. It could be one of the reasons we have such, uh, such a problem. In walking the district, I have talked to many people that work at the prison. They are scared. People that don't live at the prison are, are scared. They're worried about a, a riot. Um, across the nation right now, over the past 20 years or so, the prison populations have dropped by 7%. But in Nebraska, we have increased our population by 21%. Those numbers are alarming. So we have a fundamental problem in our entire system. And this problem is gonna take a long time to solve and we probably have issues on every single level. Um, the bad people have got to stay in prison and we've got to protect the workers that work at our prisons. Problem solving courts, courts are wonderful. It's a step in the right direction, but we have a lot of issues to correct with the prisons. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. And as the great Karnak said, I hold in my hand the final envelope and everybody cheered wildly. Uh, if you're old enough to remember that show, uh, if, if not, uh, look it up, look up Johnny Carson and the great Karnak, uh, Google it. Um, one of the things that, that uh, and, and we'll have the closing statements after this final question, uh, but one of the things that uh, is uh, very concerning is what's going to happen to the state budget as a result of shutting down the state over the next few months. Uh, we were in a very strong position to do some things like the LB 974 property tax relief, the LB 720 tax incentive bill, the $300 million for the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, but once the tax receipts start drying, uh, drying up, it could be an entirely different budget this next session, and there could be some major cuts that may be necessary as a result. Uh, so you could be walking into a very difficult situation in the 2021 legislative session. Given that, I would like to hear your thoughts about what your priorities would be going to the legislature uh, and what uh, you would work hardest to protect and what you might have to give up as a result of the uh, the rainy day fund being spent down and uh, the tax revenues uh, being dramatically less than we thought. So I will start that with uh, Julie, if you would please come forward and address that question. Well, what I wanted to do was give you the last shot and have Dennis give his opening statement first. My biggest nightmare came true. He came out with a divisible by three number of questions. <laughs> So that I didn't want the same person to have to close first, but open first. Oh, no worries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that question because it's a challenge that a month ago, no one on the state level had uh, thought of. It's a new issue that we're facing now. And I do think the fact that Nebraska is collecting sales tax revenue from internet sales is going to be a lifesaver in terms of forming our budget for next year and for the years to come. Because we don't know how long this crisis is going to last. We don't know what events are going to be canceled out beyond May and June. 
There's a possibility this could go on for longer than that. And all of those events that are canceled are an economic hit to our state. Thankfully, we're in a fantastic position financially as a state. In this last budget, we were able to replenish the rainy day fund. And in this year's budget adjustment, we were able to add even more money to it. So we're in a good spot financially as a state to take whatever hit that COVID may throw at us. For me, my priorities are just as they've been throughout my time in office. What policies and what spending within the budget best benefits Southeast Nebraska in District 1. For me, ensuring that we have the funds available to fund our schools in addition to achieving LB 974 in the property tax relief bill is certainly a priority for me. Ensuring that we keep uh, access to rural health care available. I'm excited to see from the COVID-19 crisis what moves are made in telehealth, but overall, just continuing to support responsible spending is going to be critical moving forward for our state. Thank you, Julie. And Dennis, you will go second on this. What would be your budget priorities and other priorities next session? <clears throat> well, I think there's a lot of open boxes here that haven't, we don't know what the, what's going to happen yet because, you know, we're only what, three weeks into the COVID and, you know, and from you talk to the health department, this could last up to nine months or longer. Who knows? I mean, we think we have plenty of money sitting in the rainy day fund, but you know, we've already taken 80,000, 80 million out of the thing. You know, how many more times are we going to have to do that before this is done? And, you know, nobody's going to have any money come the end of the day to pay our taxes. There's going to be a lot of the taxes that don't get paid this year. So how is everybody going to operate next year? That would be my biggest worry. Um, if I get up to the legislature, there's probably going to have to be some things that we might have to cut, guys. I mean, we're so used to having handouts for everything and having great roads and great schools and everything. But you know what? We're going to have to step up to the plate on this one after this one, tighten the belt a little bit and look at every little spot that we can cut because we're going to have to do it the way I'm looking at it right now. I mean, there is just a lot of unknowns at this point, but you know, if I get up there, I will work and do my best to cut things, but I will still protect everything that comes to Southeast Nebraska as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And Janet, your thoughts on the potential budget crisis and what your priorities would be. Well, my priority remains to be property taxes. We have got to have property tax relief, and I hope that it can happen amidst everything that we're dealing with right now. As far as the COVID-19, we do not know where we are going to be next year. We have no idea how bad this is going to get, or if there's going to be an inoculation developed by that wonderful UNMC, by the way, and hopefully we'll be able to fund their project as well. But we have no way of knowing what we are going to be dealing with. But I will tell you, being a small business owner and living through some of the times of the 80s uh, when interest rates were out of control, um, we will survive and we will have to make some very hard decisions, but I am up to the task and I'm truly looking forward to helping resolve the big, big financial challenges that we will face. But property tax will remain my most important issue in the legislature. Thank you. All right, we will now give each candidate two minutes to close to uh, bring their thoughts to us and tell us that it's their last best shot at uh, telling us why they should represent our district in the legislature. And I will be back to wrap it up after the final presentation. But leading off for the uh, closing comments will be Dennis Sharp. Dennis? Thank you, Doc, and Brent and their crew for putting this on. I think it's been very helpful for me. Uh, hopefully it's been helpful for you constituents out there to see what each three of us have to offer. We're all three very nice people, good people, and we all have great ideas. 
I will stick with, I, I mean, property taxes is still my biggest thing, guys. We've got to somehow change the way the system's working. We've got to make it more fair for everybody. Um, but I do not want to hurt the schools. We've got to keep the schools in mind. I think maybe 974, we didn't include the schools in soon enough on this deal. And that's why it struggled to get through right away. Uh, I think we need to bring everybody to the plate when it comes to it. And everybody's got to understand that you got to give and take a little bit. Uh, the broadband, <clears throat> guys, we've got to get that out here for us. We've got to find money to help make things work in this area. As Janet said, the maps are not right. We've got to do the Farm Bureau thing and do your phone on that thing and show them that it's very poor out here. Um, our highways, infrastructures, we need them worked on, we need them fixed, and I'll fight for working on the road structures, not only on the state level, but even helping the counties out to be able to fix all the bridges we have so the farmers can get their crops to the market because we have so many bridges that are bad in this state. Um, with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening in. Um, look forward to meeting you. Um, probably not going to be able to meet a lot of you with this COVID thing going on. My goal was I was taking the whole month of April off for my business. I had it all set up and I was going to be out walking every day and visiting, but now I guess I won't be. So I will probably be direct mail will be the way and phone calls and whatever way we can get a hold of you. But you know, I have a website, my phone number is there. Uh, please call me. I'd love to talk with you and thank you very much for listening in guys. All right. Thank you, Dennis. And now for her closing comments, Janet Palmtag. Janet. And thanks for having the forum. Really do appreciate it. And thanks for everyone out there who is attending virtually. I think that Southeast Nebraska needs a representative who understands business, the importance of agriculture, and the dynamics of our rural communities. I've been a small business owner and an entrepreneur for decades. I know firsthand what it means to pay property taxes how to make a payroll, how to recruit talented workforce. I also understand the importance of a strong rural community to help my business be successful as well. I've negotiated thousands of contracts over the past decade. I will bring to the legislature the skills of experience. I ask for your vote on May 12th I promise to work very hard for Nebraska. And God bless us all that we get through this coronavirus soon. Thank you so much again. Really appreciate you hosting us. Thank you, Janet. And our final closing comments will be made by Julie Slama. Julie? Thank you, and thank you all so much for tuning in to this forum. We wish you could have been here in person, but again, as we face COVID, I want to thank the leaders at the Rural Impact Hub for being proactive and still allowing this forum to go on. For me, serving another four years in the Nebraska legislature would be the honor of my lifetime. In my time in office, we have faced unprecedented challenges from the floods of 2019 to COVID-19. I've been there with District 1 every step of the way, fighting for Southeast Nebraska, ensuring that your voices are heard on the floor of the legislature. I'm doing this job very effectively. In my first year in office, I was able to pass 80% of the bills I introduced. Those included bipartisan blockbuster legislation to fight human trafficking and also to improve civics education in our state to ensure that every student is learning about the basics of government before they graduate from high school. Moving forward, I'll continue to be committed to growing Southeast Nebraska. I hope that I've earned your vote during my time in office and it would be the privilege of my lifetime to continue serving you in uh, our district. 
I'd ask that you visit votesloma.com if you'd like to volunteer or help out with my campaign. And like Dennis, I'll be getting in touch with you, not in the door-to-door -door contacts that I would prefer, but through phone, direct mail, and other ways. So please stay healthy and God bless you and God bless District 1. Thank you, Julie. You can see why I made the comments earlier tonight about the outstanding nature of our three candidates here in Legislative District 1. I would like to thank the Rural Impact Hub, uh, Brent Comstock, uh, Rebecca Johnson, and our taskmaster here tonight, Julie Eastman, who held up the time cards and told us when we were going over. She didn't have one for me. Um, and if you have any thoughts on this forum tonight, if they're positive, send them to me. If you have negative thoughts, send them to Brent and the folks at the uh, Rural Impact Hub. And thank you for tuning in. Get out there and vote on May 5th. That's what makes our country great, is the opportunity. So thank you. May 12th, well, May 12th. I'm sorry, May 12th. We'll go vote May 5th if you want. Vote early. Yeah, vote early, vote often. May 12th, <laughs> go vote May 12th. Go vote once. <laughs> oh, okay, vote once. Uh, yeah, May, go vote May 12th and uh, Go in peace and serve the district. Thank you.